Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, hello. You seem to have caught me at an inconvenient time. This is my private reflection and worship time normally. But I've heard that you kids are in need of instruction. You're in need of some guidance pertaining to a skill we like to call cross examination. See, normally during this time of private reflection, I look back over my life and I look at my face and notice that I am in need of a new skincare routine. Drop a comment or send an email or a note if you have any advice. And I think back over all the things I've done and all the things I didn't get a chance to do. But for you, I am willing and able to oblige you this once, this twice, maybe three times. I don't know how many more of these I have left in me to help you along in your litigious journey. So let us begin. Let us go boldly before um, uh, this, this, this journey here. I'm going to try to curtly and expeditiously go forth and teach these here tricks of the trade for cross examination. The journey shall begin thusly. We'll talk about in general what it means to conduct a cross examination. We'll talk about how one best uh, goes about asking questions in the proper order and the proper, proper format. And then we'll look at an example Okay, and then if we have time, time permitting, of course, uh, you're not here. So it's not like you can tell me in real time, hey, stop, I've had enough. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So if time permitting, um, we'll probably go into what an impeachment is. So let's begin. Glory be to God. Let's begin with what cross exam what cross-examinations look like. Let's talk about their structure. See, in a cross-examination, you're basically arguing by what I call soft implication. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a very smart question. See, if you're a philosophy major, if you are so lucky as to encumber yourself in such a fundamental and debilitating fashion as I was back in the day, you'll know what a, logi a logician's table is. So if you were to think about a logician's table, you have, um, I'm gonna break it down into the Aristotelian language here. Your major premise, your minor premise and your conclusion, right? These terms, a major premise, this is by deductive reasoning here. These uh, terms here refer to the structure of how an argument might go. Right, so if this is the structure of your argument, you began in the instance of deductive reasoning with first a major premise, so a rule, right? All red trucks are fire trucks. Look at your neighbor say, he's going somewhere. That black man's going somewhere. He ain't gonna take too long, said every black preacher ever. Okay, then your second premise might be 
or a minor premise might pertain to a specific, a specific instance. So this truck at, let's see, Mrs. Jones house is red. And that would be your minor premise. And then your conclusion would be, or better signified, again, sticking within the philosophical, the analytic philosophical, philosophical tradition, your therefore sign, instead of just writing C there, I'll put the three dots, which means therefore. Therefore, as your conclusion, the truck at Mrs. Jones' house, sorry, Mrs. Jones' house is a fire truck. That would be your conclusion. You still with me? This is nice and easy. See, I'm easing you in. I'm, I'm wading you, so to speak, in the water. Amen. So here we have a good example of what an actual fleshed out argument would be. And if cross-examination is an argument, then one should be able to conclude your cross-examination should look a lot like this. But notice I didn't say it should look exactly like this because, well, we'll talk about it in a second, but when I say soft implication, I mean to say you should be adopting this particular argumentative style absent the conclusion. So let me write that out more, uh, more uh, to the point. Yellow is a terrible color on the screen, by the way. I don't know why I was going to write with that. Your crosses should look like that, but without a conclusion. Okay, that part is so important. Writing a question or writing your cross with those conclusory questions, those questions which call for a conclusion, those questions which really go toward uh, the main point, the point that you're trying to prove, the point of the case, what have you, those, those questions can be objected to. In some ways, they can be objectionable. And other times, it's just bad form. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. But see, your crosses should always, overall, should be structured as this argument. You want to lead the jury to the place you want them to get to. You should lead them to the inference that you want them to draw and then leave them there to draw it for themselves. Think of it as, let's say you're a homicidal maniac talking to Leo specifically. So Leo, as a homicidal maniac, you want to drive this guy softly toward the cliff and then leave him there. So let's say this is T1. We want to lead him here at T2. You want to push. Let's say this guy is a member of the jury. You want to lead him to that point, right up to the edge. And then you want him to say, I am going to take the lead. You want him to conclude for himself and you want him to conclude for himself the very thing which you are trying to suppose to him. You want the conclusion to be chiefly his but you want it to be his under your very strong, and I don't want to use, well, seductive is a weird word, but it's the only one that pops into my mind. You want to lead him to that, to that, uh, 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 to that claim that you're trying to 
uh, suggest him to go toward without all and out saying it. You want to sort of suggest it to him. You want to get him to that point, but you want him to jump and, and, and draw that final inference for you. Now, it seems a bit circuitous to go about it in that route and a bit you know, overly wrought and, and <laughs> let's just say too, too complicated, well, not complicated, but almost too unfairly um, arduous for you to have to uh, do it that way. Why can't we just assert things to the witness and in turn the jury? Well, because again, those sorts of things can draw objections, but more importantly, it's not good form and it's actually not a very good tactic as, as we'll discuss here. So let me see. If we want the jury to get to that place, to that point, without out and out saying it, what might that look like? Well, if we go back to our fire truck example, thank you. If we were to take it in forms of questions, we would ask first and foremost, leading questions. See all of those earlier lessons that we talked about at the very outset, all of those things we talked about at the uh, very beginning, they kind of come back cumulatively. They come back and you know they, they play a role in how you do trial advocacy. And, and, and you know that's why it's important to take note of those things that I try to introduce you to at an earlier time that you might not be able to under, understand the importance of because they tend to come up down the line. They're, they're your building blocks to being a solid, successful advocate. So you want to ask leading questions. And hopefully by now, since we've talked about leading questions, you know what those are. A leading question, remember, suggests its own answer. And why do you want to ask leading questions on cross? Well, because on cross, you have to remember the attorney, A-T-T-Y is my abbreviation for that, is the star. The attorney should see himself or see herself as the focal point of this particular examination. When you're directing a witness, the witness is considered to be the star because the witness has information and you want to present the witness as favorable someone who's trustworthy, someone whose word is dependable, and you want to let that witness set the scene, set the stage, and engross and invite the jury to see the world through their lens. And you want it to be an agreeable tete-a-tete -tete between you, the attorney, and the witness, and you want the witness to be likable so that the jury finds them palatable and, and thereby finds it easier for them to believe what this witness has to say. You want the witness to be interesting. You want the witness to be incisive and insightful. You want that witness to be able to convey a narrative in a palpable and, and, and coherent and digestible fashion such that you know, the jury finds what you have to say as credible. Here is different. You're crossing the other side's witness, right? So on cross, this is an adversarial moment. Adverse, Jesus, this is really sad, y'all. Adverse, that don't look like. Ad, y'all pray for me. Y'all don't pray hard enough for me. It's been a long day. Y'all don't even know. It's, it's been a long day. Let me look this up right quick adversarial yeah it's a y'all don't pray hard enough for me at home that's all right remember snakes have holes foxes have den but the son of man has no place to lay his head that's bible uh, this is an adversarial moment meaning you are crossing the other side's witness so in these sorts of moments you want to basically steal the other side's thunder, make the other witness seem incredible. You want to make them seem like they don't know as much as they claim to know. 
you want to directly contest some important material facts and put a better spin on them so that they're more uh, advantageous to your narrative, to what you're what you're trying to prove. And in that light, you don't want to cede to the witness ground. You don't want to cede to the witness uh, any sort of, of, of meaningful point of importance. You want to keep, and you're going to hear me say this, these two words a lot, control. You want to keep power over the witness. You want to be compelling because that witness as being your ad, as being your, your counterpart, as being the adversary in this instance, is someone you're trying to beat, is someone you're trying to steal attention from. So you don't want to let them be the focal point. You don't want to let them be sympathetic. You don't want to let them be believable. You're basically coming out to say that something that they're saying which is critically important, is incorrect or incomplete. And you're taking this opportunity to steal uh, uh, whatever, whatever point that they're trying to make and, either refresh, and you're either refashioning that point to suit your narrative or you're trying to debunk it altogether, dispel it altogether. So in that way, you don't want to give them control. You want to keep control. And I'm gonna I'm say it until the cows come home. You wanna control the witness with your questions. Amen, somebody. You wanna control the witness with your questions. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor, neighbor, control the witness, control the witness with your questions. Do it just like that, like a crazy person. I'll give you a moment to go ahead and tell your neighbor that. Did you tell your neighbor? Good. Okay. Control the witness with your questions. You do that by asking leading questions, so questions that suggest the answer. What's an example? Here's open. Here's an open-ended question. I'll write it in blue. Did you go to the store versus you went to the store, didn't you? Now I'm gonna take you back to advanced, uh, advanced placement English for just a brief second. Then I'm gonna bring you back to trial advocacy 101. Y'all be all right. I hope that won't trigger you. Um, now you'll notice a trick of the trade is in most leading questions in most of their structure, it's a declaratory sentence followed by here, what we would call an interrogative particle. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good word. That's a good SAT word. Too bad y'all have already taken it. But if you can go back in time and take it, I bet you wish you knew that term. Um, interrogative particle. So basically an add-on that converts your declaratory statement or sentence into a question. So instead of just you know asking, did you go to the store? You can assert, you went to the store, didn't you? And you can ask it in a way such that it's technically kind of a question, but not really, right? Most leading questions are like that. A lot of leading questions assert. They often assert a claim to the witness to be confirmed, okay? So you wanna ask that leading question, assert it to the witness sometimes, and then add the didn't you. You know, be careful of ticks. I don't know why I didn't just 
make that into one word. But don't overuse. I'm just, I'm all over the place, y'all. Y'all gotta forgive me. Don't overuse. Don't use the same interrogative particle. Don't say, you did this, didn't you? And then you did that, didn't you? And then you did this, didn't you? You don't wanna use the same ones. You know, some, sometimes people use, you know, right a lot. It was dark outside, right? It happened at 1030, right? You went inside because it was so dark, right? And obviously as it was dark, you couldn't see, so you turned on the light, right? And you turned on the light and saw so-and-so sitting at the dining room table, right? When you keep adding that right, you know, that's a good example of, or a correct or whatever. You can throw them in every once in a while to make it clear to the witness that you're asking. Because sometimes when you get on your, on your, on your, on a roll in your flow, sometimes the witness will kind of look at you like, is that a question? Or are you just saying something to me? So you might throw in an interrogative particle um, as a way of reminding them that it's a question, but you don't want to overuse them and you don't want to overuse the same one, right? Be see, I just did it. You don't want to overuse it because then you'll, it'll come off as robotic, repetitive, scripted. And it's also just distracting. When you hear that same tick over and over, especially as a, as a juror who has a seventh grade education, they, they won't pick up on all of the subtleties, all of the, all of the nuances of the fact pattern and the intricacy of, of your overall theory, but they will pick up on stupid shit like that. And they'll use that to penalize you. So you don't wanna be penalized because you're not polished, you're, you, because you're making a, a sloppy error that detracts needlessly from the substance of your performance. Amen, somebody. I'm preaching good in here, y'all. That's why they pay me the, the big bucks of zero dollars and zero cents. The Lord is in his holy temple. Amen. So, you know, you can use your interrogative particles to remind the, the witness every once in a while that you're asking a question, but don't overuse it. It becomes a verbal tick. So I'll write that down because it becomes, whoops. A verbal tick and you don't want that. I think it's TIC when it refers to an involuntary reflux, reflex and then TICK when it refers to the parasite. I don't remember. Y'all saw how I struggle with adversarial, so yikes. All right. I know y'all like my John Madden board. Look how pretty that looks. All right. Anyway, let's keep on moving. So we know to ask leading questions on cross, and those are the reasons why. You want to keep control. Cross is all about control and power. This is your number one goal. I probably should write that in a, in a distinct color so that you might be reminded, amen. Nope, back, let me change the color, thank you. This is your goal. You wanna keep that power, you wanna keep that control. So leading questions is the first and foremost tool in your toolbox, in your bag. If you watch the NBA or you on NBA Twitter, you would have heard that phrase before in your bag. That's, that's your number one tool in your toolbox. That's your most important skill in your bag that helps you keep control over your witness is those leading questions. Got to have them. I don't want any open-ended questions. We're not at that level. Sometimes when you get to the advanced stage, you'll see some attorneys who are really, really good at what they do in terms of litigation. They have a way, they have a method whereby they can ask an open-ended question, but it's really a trap question to get them, get the witness into the box they want them into so that they can really start going after them. But that takes a lot of you know, forethought, a lot of planning. Right? We're not quite there yet. This is just the basics. 
So number two, your order and your structure of questions. Your order is just as important. Your order is very important in your questions. What you ask is, is just as important as when you ask it. You want your questions to be on top of one another in an argument in an argumentative fashion, in a way that resembles this logician's table, right? This is I, I said that at the beginning, but you know, I'll just I'll write logician's table here. Just in case. Just in case we gotta twist it. That looks like logical's table. I write like an arthritic 80 year old, I'm sorry. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Okay, so you wanna ask your questions in a way that resembles that logician's table. You wanna write through it. You wanna go through your questions in an order so that again, you push your juror closer and closer to that edge and right up, right to the point of the precipice and then let them make the final leap. So your order is very important. You wanna have your questions tightly worded. What do I mean by that? Avoid the burrito question. Yet another term I have to define. Whoops. Okay. One fact per question. Yet another thing that could be technically objectionable, but also just not good practice. There's an objection called compound question, an objection to the form of the question in which an advocate asks more than one asks for more than one fact in a question. You went to the store, then you went to Arby's, and then you came home. That's one question technically, but that's three different uh, that's three different facts being asked in one question. And so that could be objectionable. Some judges may. Uh, some judges may sustain the objection. Oh, let's get into that stage where it's like it wants to charge, but not really. That's funny. Um, some judges may overrule the objection. Some judges may sustain the objection. Doesn't really matter. Um, because more than it being objectionable or not, it's about maintaining control over the witness. And so this is what you have to avoid. If you ask more than one question, let's take, or ask for one of more than one fact in a question, let's take my example that I just gave you. You went to the store, then Arby's. I guess my dude over here is fixing for some congestive heart failure. And then home. A good witness, an evasive witness, is it going to give you the answer that you want all the time on that? You might just want a simple yes to that question because the guy did indeed go to the store, then Arby's and then home. But a witness who wants to maintain their power, who wants to maintain his control, like me, who's iron headed, hard headed, that witness might pick up, pick apart your question. They might pick one part of the question and, and answer that. Yeah, I went to the store and I bought some sugar donuts and man, them donuts was busted. You know, you, you ever take a donut and just and just dip it in some in some whole milk? See, I used to do that back in the day. I learned that from my grandmother. If you could just but take a donut and dip it in some milk, oh man, it'd be it, 
how you how your lips smack and it just be good and sweet like that. I just deflected from the point of your asking that long question, that needlessly long question, by focusing on one part of the question that you've asked, answering it sort of kinda, and then going on a tangent. I just wrestle control away from you in my responsive but not really responsive answer because you left me a door open. I loved those burrito questions as a witness because it gave me an opportunity to use my logical mind in dissecting what exactly they're asking and then go to my playful side and take, take, a, take a conjunct because technically this is a conjunction. So I'm taking a conjunct of that and, and saying, okay, I'm just going to talk about what I want to talk about out of the three options. A good witness is looking at a compound question like this as not a question to be answered, but a menu from which they can pick one thing of many to talk about. That's a good one. I'm going to write that down. I'm preaching good. Compound questions put you on the menu. <laughs> I like that one. They literally put you on the menu. These compound questions give the witness a piece of paper, give the witness a, a menu, a bevy of options from which they can pick on what they talk, what they want to talk about. And you don't want to give them a pick of what to talk about. You want to lead them. You want to tell them, hey, this is what it is. You went home. You went to the store, right? Then you went to Arby's and then you came home. You don't wanna ask them all in one question because you're just giving them a choice. Tightly worded, condense your questions. So when you, if you ever hear me, if I like go on your cross after you've written your crosses, if, if, if you ever um, uh, go in, in, into the crosses and I've edited them or I've made a comment like I did your direct and, and I say, hey, this needs to be more tightly worded. That's what I mean. I mean, you're asking too much. You're asking for too many things in one question or this could be more tightly worded. You know, sometimes it's a burrito question. Other times it's, you know, stick to the affidavit. This is why, if you remember all the way back to the beginning, all the way back a decade ago, when Danielle gave you the, the PowerPoint, and she used the PowerPoint sort of to give you a speed, a very, very fast crash course into mock trial. And one of the things it said was, to my recollection, you got to know the affidavit well when you're crossing. Well, yeah, that's true. You, you want to know the affidavit really well. Um, but specifically, you want to do that so that when you're asking your question, you're not giving them any room to wiggle. No room for uh, obfuscation. You don't want any room to allow the witness to to make up or, 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 or distort or reword what you're trying to get them to agree to. And so if you just ask generally what the witness did instead of specifically what their report says that they did, then you're giving them, again, you're giving them, you're putting yourself on the menu. You're giving them an opportunity to logically pick apart, well, what specifically was the question? And then you're giving them room to wiggle, right? Because witnesses like me and good witnesses are constantly looking for opportunities to derail you, to pull you off. So you wanna stick to your affidavit so that there's absolutely no room, no room for error. No room for the witness to say, well, technically no. So let me give you a tangible example. Let's stick with the, um, let's stick with the Arby's example. So let's say, um, let's say 
the witness's affidavit. Okay, I don't know why I was gonna write, let's say, but let, let's say the witness's affidavit says, um, and an affidavit is just a sworn statement. So those story, the, the three to four page accounts from the perspective of each person saying what they saw, what they heard, what they did at or around events pertaining to the incident, that's the affidavit. So the affidavit in question here, let's see, let's say the affidavit says, um, you know, I went home around nine o'clock, watched a movie and went to bed. You don't want the question to be, this is just a silly example. You went home and then I guess questions because this is about to be two questions. You don't want the questions to be, you went home, then you went to bed. Why not? I'll give you a second. It's like Dora the Explorer. I give you a question and then I look at the screen with that stupid smile on my face like so I can pretend that I can hear you at home. Why not? I heard that. F you too. Exactly. You don't want to ask that question because it's not tailored. It's not narrowly tailored. There's a, a, a substantive due process um, point there for you if you're studying con law. But anyway, this question is not narrowly tailored to the affidavit. So there's room to wiggle. This witness in response can say, well, no, I didn't go straight to bed when I got home. No. Then what? It knocks you off your plan. It knocks you off course. And it seems small and minor. And sometimes those sorts of distinction, uh, those, those, that sort of distinction making is small and minor, but it can do a lot of real damage because it throws you off. And no offense, I love you all, but you all are newbies. So it's really gonna be imperative for you to have these tightly worded questions. Because if you're not tightly worded, then one instance of a witness being a not very nice person can throw you off course can throw you off track. And that can serve to uh, um, make you stumble. So what would happen if you ask, you know, you went home and then you went to bed and the witness just said no. You'd have to have a backup question ready. And then the heat of the moment where your nerves are, 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 are jittery, you might not know how to bounce back from that, especially as a new person. When you really should be asking, you went home, you watched a movie and then you went to bed. If you have it more narrowly tailored to your uh, to the affidavit, then if they say no, you can move straight into what we call impeachment. See, I told you we was gonna get there. Look at your neighbor said that black man had a plan all along. That black man, he had a plan all along. Let me get somebody to talk back to me in this in this Presbyterian house. The black man had a plan. If this witness, if your if your question is tight tightly worded, if your question is tightly worded and you don't get the answer that you want, you are better suited for impeachment. Okay, so let's talk about impeachment, okay? And then we're gonna look at an example of a cross real quick. And then uh, I'm gonna get you out of here, hey, man. We moving fast, come on now, you just learned a lot and give yourself a pat on the back, stretch a little bit. 
You just learned a lot in a short period of time. Maybe you learned nothing at all and you just hear from my whatever. Um, anyway, so impeachment. What is impeachment? No, not, not Article One impeachment, not Article One of the Constitution impeachment. Um, impeachment is basically our way of impugning, that's a nice word for you again, go back and take that SAT again, your verbal score go up 30% fucking with me. Um, our way of impugning a witness's credibility. Hey man, somebody, I wish I had some help in this house. I'm preaching all by myself, but I'm preaching a storm up in here. Impeachment is a way of impugning a witness's credibility. Now, technically, I'm going to sow a seed here because I know some of y'all are going to go off and you're going to bother me. You're going to harass my team on the Amtha circuit this year. So I'm going to give you a freebie but you know, I can't give you too many of these. I'm gonna give you a little nugget. Okay, so in real life, in fed, in, according to Federal Rules of Evidence, FRE, that's what that stands for, Federal Rule of Evidence, uh, 608 and 609, and I guess technically those being the logical consequences of uh, uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 404A3, is it 404A3? Yeah, it's 404A3, 404A3. So um, those rules allow for uh, either a specific instance of untruthfulness. Here's a time this person was untruthful. And so therefore, because they were untruthful at this moment in history or this particular time, we can't trust them to be a truthful person here on the stand. Or in the case of 609, you know, here's a prior conviction. You know, this person is a, is a jailbird. And because this person is a jailbird, we can't trust him to know his left from his right, let alone to tell the truth. This person committed a crime pertaining to truthfulness or untruthfulness. And therefore, we can't trust this person to tell the truth. So, you know, well, impeachment is a is a very broad term that includes uh, trying to show a character trait of truthfulness or untruthfulness. But specifically, when we're talking about cross and impeachment, we're talking about something a little different. We're talking about a prior inconsistent statement. And in a prior, we were using uh, a prior inconsistent statement, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. You said X in court, but you said Y in your deposition or in your affidavit or when you was talking to your buddies. And those statements are inconsistent. And because of that, we don't know what to believe because the statements are semantically different. We don't know what's true or what's not. So impeachment is a broad term for impugning a witness's credibility. But you know, one way of impeachment pertains to, I want to show you that this person, his character, her character is such that she is constitutionally, just by virtue of who she is, incapable of telling the truth. So that's a more you know, personal attack, for lack of a better phrase, on who this person is. And, and how, who they are as a person reflects on their ability to tell the truth versus prior consistent statement. I'm trying to show you that what this particular person said at this moment is different than what she has said in the past. So how does that tie into what we talked about with tightly worded? This ties in directly. So let's say, let's go back to our example. Let's say I asked a better question. So if I asked, you went home, saw a movie, then went to bed. 
Okay, let's call that question. I don't know. I tried to write question prime, but I don't know what the hell that was. So let's just say this is this is, you know, there you go. So this is a better version of that. That question here. If I asked you went home, you saw a movie and then you went to bed and the person says no to this, then I can pull out their affidavit and say, well, in your affidavit, you said you went home, you watched a movie and you went to bed, right? So why would you say no when I asked you that here in court today? That's not how you would do it, but that's basically the overall gist. That's the point of what the prior inconsistent statement uh, impeachment is. That's the point of it. You're showing, hey, I asked this person a question. They responded no, but in their report, it went down exactly how I said it went down and this person is lying or this person has simply changed their testimony, which goes directly to their credibility. Now notice, if it's not tightly worded, you can't do that. How can you impeach? Let's say you asked these questions instead of the better questions here. Let's say you ask these questions. Can you, can you, uh, can you impeach if the witness says no there? Let's say the witness says, no, I didn't just go home and then go to bed. I went home and then I watched a movie and then I went to bed. How do you impeach on that? You can't. So you have lost control of the witness. If the witness just says, no, it didn't happen like that. Then you try to go to impeach and you realize, oh yeah, <laughs> he really didn't lie. Then what? You just sort of lost control and this witness gets to get away and in a sense, he looks more credible because you didn't tell the whole story in your cross and this witness had the better command of the facts than you did because your question wasn't tightly worded. It wasn't worried to the affidavit. It wasn't married to the affidavit. That's why that's so important, okay? All of this is about power and control. So if you're tightly worded to your affidavit, right? You, you have a good order instruction to your structure, to your questions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at our example. You, you ask leading questions you know, and you don't ask the question too far, the conclusion. These are all good uh, principled first steps of uh, bedrock skills to being effective at cross-examination. You don't wanna ask the conclusion question. I know earlier I told you I'd get to it. I'll get to, I'll talk about it right now. Why can't we talk about, why can't we just ask the person the conclusion? And let's use that as an example with, or use as an example, the questions we talked about with the fire truck. So, Lord have mercy. One day I'm gonna learn how to spell. Conclusory questions. So all red trucks are fire trucks. Mrs. Jones's truck one day I'm gonna learn how to write too. Um, Mrs. Jones's truck is uh, red, therefore therefore, how did I write no? Therefore, Jones' truck is a fire truck. So let's think through this for a second. Let's say cross went 
this way. And I added a conclusory question. Y'all with me? Talk to me now. When I hear you, Leo, thank you. You're talking back to me. Now, let's say cross went this way. All red trucks are fire trucks. Mrs. Jones truck is red, right? Therefore, Mrs. Jones truck is a, is a fire truck. Let's say this was in the affidavit. This is in the affidavit. But this is more so a logical conclusion. You know, I'll write question mark. You no know, conclusion, deduction. This person says yes to this. Yes, all fire trucks are, are red. Yes, Mr. Attorney. Mrs. Jones truck is red, but no, Mrs. Jones truck is not a fire truck. Then what do you do? You can't impeach because it's not in the affidavit. The conclusion that you've asked for isn't in the affidavit. So she's not accountable. She's not accountable to what she's written. So she's not accountable to what you have concluded. Logically, I agree, it's a logical conclusion, but the witness doesn't have to say, doesn't have to agree with you. Just be, yes, just because it's logical, just because it's a logical conclusion, just because it's a conclusion that a reasonable person, a reasonable person would make based on the facts that are in her affidavit, that doesn't mean that she has to agree with the conclusion that you're drawing. It's kind of messed up, isn't it? But it bees like that sometimes. Look at your neighbor and tell them it bees like that sometimes. If you learn nothing else from trial advocacy, it's that pearl of wisdom. It bees like that sometimes. Yeah, but that's not what the rule says. It be like that sometimes. Yeah, but she lied on the stand. It be like that sometimes. They had blood going from the Bronco all the way back to the girl's house. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It be like that sometimes. Witnesses and juries don't always follow logic and reason. And unless you have a, a, a foolproof proof plan to penalize them for that, then they can, they can kind of get away with it. So if there is no point in the affidavit that you can directly impeach this person on, then cut out the conclusory question. And this is the importance of the skill of leading your jury very softly. We're gonna go real slow. Look at that red line. Look how pretty that red line is. Just moving, we're moving. And we stop right at that edge. We're pushing them toward the edge, very with, 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 with great finesse, with great clarity, with a little bit of panache, removing them toward that precipice in a suggestive manner, and then stopping and letting them say, oh yeah, it's obvious. This witness agrees all fire trucks are red. This witness agrees that Ms. Jones' truck is red. Okay, let the jury make the conclusion. Don't ask the question. Don't try to be obvious, be Captain Obvious about it and beat the jury about the head with it and, and ask that extra question, that question too far. I'm gonna write that down because you know that's how I often refer to it is the question too far. You don't wanna ask that question too far you want to lead them to the precipice and let the jury come to that conclusion. Why? Because sometimes you'll get an objection that says calls for, you know, calls for conclusion or whatever, or you'll, you'll get, yeah, you'll, you'll get a question that says argumented an objection to the question is argumentative, but more importantly, um, it's, it's bad form because what happens if your witness disagrees with your reasonable conclusion based on the facts and that conclusion isn't in the affidavit then you can't impeach how do you bounce back from it and newbies will ask that question too far a lot it's a it's the number one rookie mistake i'll write that down number one i'll write number twice young folks before this was a hashtag this was called a pound sign 
Y'all don't y'all know that. I just taught you something brand new. Look at God. This is a pound sign. Number one, rookie mistake. Asking the question too far. So they'll ask it, the witness says, no, that's not right. And then they'll backpedal, they'll go, well, and then they'll go through the cycle again. Well, all fire trucks are red, right? And Mrs. Jones truck was, was a fire truck, so you have to agree. And they'll keep doing it because they're flustered because it's like, it's obvious, it's reasonable, it's logical that if you agree with the first two premises, then surely you have to agree with the conclusion. But no, if it's not in the affidavit, if it's not tightly worded, then, then there's no way to hold that witness accountable. So instead, you ask questions you know the answer to, you ask questions that are tightly worded to the affidavit, and then you order them correctly so that you push the jury to that precipice and let the jury come to that conclusion for you. Instead of trying to shove the jury over the edge and get the witness to go with you for the witness to stop it and say, no, that's not what happened. Yeah. And then what do you do? There's no way to bring it back. So don't ask that question too far. Okay, that's your number one rookie mistake. Do not ask that question too far. Does that make sense? Because if you ask that question too far, you know, I'll write some of the objections again. So objectionable, kind of, I'll write the question mark. Objectionable, kind of, how? Well, you know, you can, you can get the um, uh, argumentative objection. But more so, it's because it's just bad form. You lose control. You lose control. And all of cross is about what? What is it about? Psst, there's a hint. It's the part that says this is your goal right there in the middle of your screen. So what's the goal across? It's to keep power and control. And you lose control when you ask that question too far. Okay. Now, sometimes I'll grant you, you, the question too far may be enforced by the affidavit. And so it's kind of a field thing in those very rare fringe, very, very, very rare fringe circumstances. But nine times out of 10, it's not. So don't go there. Order your questions properly. Tightly, wed the wording tightly to the affidavit. Lead them, and then let the jury get to it, okay? Amen, somebody? Amen. I guess we'll talk about uh, how to do impeachment in a separate video, but I'm glad I introduced you to the topic. Glory be to God. I think impeachment will be a separate video, all right? So let's move to an example. Y'all not with me. An example of what a cross might look like. And then I'm gonna hit the road. I'm gonna hit you with that benediction and you'll be able to go in peace. Now, so here's a good example. Let's look at the structure. Okay, so notice in bold, what do we have here? Let me go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna take a bam, just like that. Now notice, what do you have here? Does this look familiar? I wanna start by talking to you about your first counseling session with Jordan in 2010. This was borrowed from some of our, by our, I mean, University of Richmond's trial materials from a case two, three years ago. So in case you're trying to snake out my team, Richmond, for the Amp circuit with some old, with some case material, this ain't current, so you ain't cute. Nice try though. Um, so, this is borrowed from some of our old case materials. And if you look at the wording right here, I wanna start by talking about your first counseling session with Jordan in 2010. What does that look like? It's a headline or a signpost. Notice that skill of headlining, of telling the jury, this is where we're going. This is where we're going, jury, before each section of your questions. 
that retains no matter if you're doing cross, if you're doing direct, if you're doing redirect, recross, it doesn't matter. If you're asking questions, you need to headline. So headlining is a constant. That's a staple of your skill. That's, a, that's always in your toolbox and you should use it whenever necessary. So that headlining is still there, even though it's on cross. So it makes clear where you're going, right? Y'all see that? Amen, somebody. So in these next few questions, you see, let's read, let's read through them together. During these sessions with Jordan, she often attempted to avoid sensitive subjects. She didn't talk. She didn't want to talk about her husband's death. She didn't want to talk about her relationship with Corbin. There was one thing that she raved about, and that was her, her, her daughter, Parker. Jordan referred to her as the only light in her life. Okay, so let's just focus on that first cross pocket there. Oh, Sean Doe. And by the way, by, by cross pocket, I mean section. So sometimes I, I say cross pocket. That's just really nerdy mock trial terminology for um, section, section of a cross. So you see here, we have premise, we have premise, we have premise. Now, there's a, there was a course at Richmond called Philosophical Methods, where the class was literally reading really, really difficult to read philosophical writings, and then analyzing literally word by word. Why is that word there? Why is that word there? Do they really need this word? Do they need this sentence? What's the point of it? How does it move us forward? And so I think a little bit across is engaging that with that level of criticism, each and every question you put down on a cross to ask, why is it there? Because cross has to be more precise than direct. Direct's easy, cross is hard because every, every word can mean the difference between a home run and a strikeout swinging with the bases loaded down by two runs at the bottom of the night with two outs. So you want to get it right. Okay, so during these sessions with Jordan, how to, you know, she often avoided sensitive subjects. She didn't want to talk about her husband's death. She didn't want to talk about her relationship with Corbin. What is the point of those three questions? She's talking about, there are all these different things that she didn't want to talk about, right? But there's one thing that she raved about. Okay, that's a, that's a setup question. That's a little advanced. A question, in other words, we don't care about what the answer to it is, but don't worry about that for right now. There's one question. There's one thing that Jordan raved about, and it was her daughter, Parker. And Jordan loved her very much, and she was able to have a line reference to that. So all these premises led to this conclusion that she didn't want to talk about anything in her life. She didn't want to talk about her relationship with this person, but she did want to talk about this one thing. She wanted to talk about this one thing, and that was this her, uh, Jordan's daughter. So what's the point? The premises lead to this conclusion that, oh, this Jordan must have loved their daughter, right? So you see the order, the, the pace, the wording. Look at the anaphoric construction here. She didn't want to talk about, she didn't want to talk about, but there was one thing she did want to talk about. It kind of gives a rhythm to the cross, right? She didn't want to do this, she didn't want to do that, but there was one thing she did want to do. Premise, 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 and I lead the jury to the conclusion without really stating it. Now she was able to kind of get away with hinting at it because she had a line number, and that's another commonality here or not another commonality, another, another key element of the, of the cross is you see these numbers in parentheses there. All these numbers are line references in affidavit. Why? In case, in case the witness lies, then I know, okay, I have a line number that backs up exactly what I'm saying. So in case this person lies, I can go through the impeachment litany. And we'll talk about the impeachment litany 
in a separate video because I because the hour is already far spent in the words of every black preacher ever. See, I told you I lied at the beginning when I said it was going to be short. Um, so you see here, the line numbers are references to the exact spot in the affidavit where this fact is mentioned. And if it's tightly worded to that, to that affidavit, then it'll just be a simple readout. It'll be your affidavit says, and it will be pretty damn close, if not exactly verbatim, to the wording of the question that's asked to make it clear that this person is saying X, I said you said X, and now this person is lying. Right, so that's what the line numbers are there for. So your cross needs to have these headlines in the same way a direct does. It needs to have line numbers in the same way that, uh, well, not the same way, but so that um, you'll be able to impeach if you need to impeach, okay? Is that clear? I hope so. Now let me get out of that. I'm gonna discard it. We're gonna keep on moving. Okay. So basically every other point is structured in here in the same way. So to give you a little context for this next section, to give you a better example of pushing the jury toward the edge without, without asking that question too far, I really shouldn't have clicked on the body of the document because now I can't. Okay, there we go. To give you some context, this case was a murder case in which basically the parent of a child was confused, was, uh, was uh, accused of pushing their child off the ledge of a cliff, which is ironic given the exact uh, metaphor I gave you for how to do cross-examination. Uh, I guess Freud would say that's my subconscious at work. Anyway, Let's get back to it. So here's a good example. Knowing the background of the case, knowing that what the case is about, we can analyze you know, what the conclusion of this is supposed to be, the conclusion of this section. I want to talk to you about some sessions you had with Jordan in 2017 while she was incarcerated. There's your headline, right? All right. So Jordan asked, can you help me get my little girl back? Jordan wanted Parker back so badly that she was willing to do whatever it takes. Okay, those are your line numbers. In case your witness lies, you can go, bam. I know exactly where you said this, so you can't lie to me. Oh. Uh, while, while you were counseling her, Jordan enrolled in anger management classes. So, you know, Jordan, in, uh, behavior improved. These improvements kept happening to the point where you advocated for her early release. So what's the point? What's the point of this? Jordan wanted to see her daughter. Jordan made substantive improvements so that she would be better suited to be a parent for her daughter. Therefore, what? Jordan, the conclusion is Jordan became a good parent. Not just in general, but Jordan became a good parent according to witness. Because then the last question is, you were proud to advocate for Jordan's early release. So yeah, sorry, another bit of context. Jordan was incarcerated for a bar fight before the alleged incident took place. So Jordan was in jail trying to get her daughter back. Um, eventually got custody back after she was released and sometime thereafter is when the alleged incident occurred. So. The, the headline, this is what happens when she was incarcerated. She, all she talks about is wanting to get her daughter back. She loves her daughter. She wanted to get better as a parent. And this witness believes that, you know, her improvement was enough to get released. Well, what does that indicate? That indicates that, well, Jordan became a good parent. That's the conclusion that we want the witness, the jury to draw. But at no point 
at no point did we ask it. Y'all see that? Good, isn't it? So talked about Jordan's love for the daughter, Jordan doing the anger management, the behavior and impulse control, the vocational classes. Jordan continued to do well in those classes. You did a final re review and you said she was ready for release. At no point did I say, therefore, you think Jordan's a good parent. Therefore, you don't think that Jordan's capable of committing this crime. None of that conclusory stuff. None of that stuff that goes to her character either, but we're not talking about character evidence. None of that conclusory stuff. All we're saying are, here are some tangible facts that I can back up with an affidavit number. So in case she lies, I can pull out the affidavit and go directly to the spot that says exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> she, she believes or she did according to her own words. I have these facts here. I've lined them up in a very convenient way in an argument. You love the daughter. Jordan loved the daughter. Jordan took steps mm -hmm. to take care of the daughter. And, and now, and now, what in the world? Oh my Lord. And now um, she was ready at the end of her prison stay, or she was ready in the middle of her prison stay for, for early release. She did all these things and the conclusion is it made her a better parent. It made her better able. And she did so well that you know, I wanted her to go out early. She became such a good parent. I thought she was ready right away. That was the point of this section, but we didn't ask it directly. We didn't ask. You thought she was a good parent. You thought that she wouldn't be capable of any of this stuff. It's just strongly implied with the way the questions are worded and, and the order and the tightness of the questions. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. If it's repetitive, what I just said, it was supposed to be because all of it goes to, all of it goes to uh, hopefully clarity so that is, this is easily understood. All right. So that was a long one, but you learned. And maybe next time you won't interrupt my quiet reflection. I'll see y'all at another time. Until then, may the grace of God, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you now and forevermore. You can go in peace. Deuces.